Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to the Woke Blokes podcast. Ryan Hassan from the Centre for Healing here, joined as always by Nick Sutherland from MindFit. Nico, how are you today? I'm amused. No grand yeah, introduction you, you, for you today. No grand introduction. We, we've got a we've got a guest, and you've really just pared it back. You've really toned it down. <laughs> well, I want to I want to get to our guest as soon as possible. Nick, can you introduce our, our wonderful guest for the day? Just standard Nick. Okay. We, <laughs> we have uh, we have the pleasure of chatting with uh, David Baker from the principal of Woodley. Um, a, a school on the on the Mornington Peninsula down here uh, for, for those listeners interstate and internationally as well. So, David, thank you so much for, for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Great to be here. Well, um, I'm, I'm keen as mustard because, um, well, I'll let you explain. Woodley, Woodley's uh, and, and the schools under, under the banner of yours are a little bit different to the mainstream systems, aren't they? Um, yeah, I think so. I, I, I guess we, the school was founded under a little bit of a different approach to uh, to normal schools. Like when Woodley's actually the oldest co-educational independent school in Victoria. It's over 160 years old. People don't wow. realise that. But, but the senior campus where I'm at today um, has been around since the early 70s and it was really um, built on the premise of challenging the way education was being done in the world at that time. Um, and uh, it, was real, it was very much around... Um, the guy who, I guess, the first principal of Woodley was Michael Norman, and he sort of um, built the school on the premise that, you know, that students, we, we shouldn't do for the kids what they can with the challenge be able to do for themselves. So this idea of challenge, um, but also this idea of creating community. Um, so it's a slightly different. The whole school is built around the, the concept of homestead, so the students have this sense of connection to a, a particular homestead and also passion Um so if you ask me what the big difference is, it's about relationships and experiences. Our kids have a lot of experiences and that's how they form their relationships with each other and also with uh, their teachers and the school. And so the, the concept of challenge, that wouldn't have been because the, the school system is quite archaic and out of date and out of fashion by any chance, would it? I mean... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> a bit um, like the penal system, a bit yeah. like lots of systems. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've got a lot of friends local and my partner, um, Emma, as well, who attended Woodley. Um, I've got clients who their, their children attend Woodley and, and I'm, I only ever hear wonderful things about it and I'm, I'm kind of bummed I didn't go there, a bit jealous actually, <laughs> because because there is all this um, connection. There's all this get your hands dirty. There, there is this, mm-hmm. these sort of, I don't know, introducing some life skills as well as scholastic. It, it really seems to me like emotional intelligence or EQ is factored in, which is blowing my mind. Yeah. No, it's a, and it, look, it's sort of, I think if you think about schools and still some schools today, it was, they're about, you know, force feeding facts and figures down kids' throats and then asking them to regurgitate them for a test at the end and, uh, and, and having a very narrow view of it. But I think we will. I think we were one of the first genuinely holistic schools. So we're really about developing capabilities with kids and connecting their learning to the real world, so that there's a a real sense of um, well, why do I need to know this? And and if you connect it to the real world, they go a lot deeper with it as well in terms of their understanding. Um, but through that, you develop independence and mm. build, you know, collaborative it's problem solving. Yeah, all the things yeah. that you need in the real world. So you know, I, that's I what love it. I love Einstein's quote about if you judge a fish in its ability to climb a tree, it will always fail. And and I, I think, I don't know, your thoughts, David, I get the feel that that's not the case at your school. It's like, let's just, let's help them all to nourish in and grow in, in whatever way they need to. Yeah. And I think it's, um, I mean, we talk about strengths, not deficits. So, you know, if the kids, through all the experiences they have, we hope that we can, the kids find the things that they're good at. Um and we can uncover those, but the school can be aware of them, of those things. So part of it is, you know, the traditional teacher only sees the kids in the classroom, but because of all the, I guess, the, the experiences we have at our school, teachers get to see kids through multiple lenses. So they find out what their strengths are and what they're good at and what their interests mm-hmm. are. And then there's a, a more genuine connection. Um, and then you can actually bring those strengths back into the classroom 
um, which is then going to enhance their learning significantly. If the you know if the teacher knows who you are and what you're good at, um, and where your point of challenge is, that's that makes a huge difference. I love what you're talking about. Can I come and work there. I was going to say, Nick, maybe we should go as mature age students. Yeah, I just want to. Oh, can I get a job there, or can I just come and hang out? Um, no, I probably can't just hang out at the school, can you? These days, no, so, it's not, a bit, a bit frowned really. upon. Yeah, uh, uh, it's, uh, I love, I love that you know we're experiential learners. You, you, Ryan and I talk about you can't, you can't replicate experience. You, you just you can sit here and, and look at a whiteboard or a blackboard all you want, and you know assimilate information but you can't you can't beat experience and, and i think from my understanding that the kids at woodley really get to experience a lot of things is that is that how you, you see it yeah and that, that's exactly right so we try and connect and we try and connect their learning to all sorts of things so we have a farm on the school side um we have a we have a native uh, bush flora and fauna reserve so so we've got kids here who are part of a bandicoot breeding program. Um, they breed quolls. We also, you know, we, we, we farm sheep, we farm goats, we have chickens. Um, we've been part of the cat, the Calves Create Careers program, so we've had little baby cows come on site. Um, so it, it just provides a really nice context for learning. So, I mean, to give you an example, I was teaching some year eight science last year and the kids we're learning about the digestive system, so the Victorian curriculum, that's what it's there. And I could easily have given them some great PowerPoints on the digestive system and asked them to remember it. But instead, we we went and learned about the digestive system of little, you know, little baby calves. And and the, our line of inquiry became, you know, is farming animals bad for the environment and why? But if, you, if you're going to answer that question, you've got to understand how digestion works in humans and how is that different to a cow. Um, but also, what is the other impact that farming animals has on the, on um, our environment? But what's the positives that come out of farming animals? So, how would you replace that? So, really getting to think deeply about um, not just memorizing the parts of the digestive system, but understanding that the, you know, if you know about the digestive system, you can explore a whole lot of other systems in the world and understand how they interact with each other. It's brilliant. Are you exposing them to? Are you exposing them to permaculture at a very early age? By the sound of it, we are. Uh, we are. We're looking at permaculture. So a number of our staff have been studying that at the moment, and permaculture fits beautifully with our approach to well-being, which is um, totally. compassionate systems thinking. And uh, in and you know the idea of permaculture is you know if you pay attention to the soil conditions, then you can get good growth and. Um, and that can be applied in the real world if you're a farmer or if you're whatever you're doing, but it also applies in the social world as well. If you can pay attention to the soil conditions of our kids and our staff and our families, they're more likely to thrive in our community. As I'm not sure if David's gone back through all the episodes and, and listened to us prior to today, but there may be one of interest. We, we interviewed Luby McIntyre. Yeah. Libby McIntyre from uh, from the UK, and she's a big permaculture teacher over there. And yeah, she spoke spoke beautifully about it. My partner M studied permaculture. We've got forty acres up in um, Queensland in Agnes Water. So if you're looking for a, a Queensland sort of base for your students to come up to, we're happy to host them up there. And if you want a campus up there, that'd be, that'd be that's, great. <laughs> that's where the surf finishes is Agnes Waters, isn't it? At the last point. Yeah. In yeah. Yeah, that's the, the northernmost surf beach in Australia. Yeah, but um, yeah, we're heading there in December. It's all land for wildlife, but we really want to bring people. Um, I'm an ex veteran, so I want to I want to run veteran retreats up there. But you know, I, I'm really passionate about. You know, be careful how you word that, Nick. Uh, I'm really passionate about um, engaging with kids at that early age and, and planting seeds because they are such fertile soil. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, and that's and you know that if you can influence the way they're thinking, um, but also you know we've got to understand that kids think differently as well. So they think differently than when I was a kid. My parents were a kid, um, and even my my own kids think differently to the current kids at school. Mm. Um, you know, because we and we have to sort of understand that and be able to you know if we keep doing things the same way all the time, we sort of miss the boat on where the kids need to be. You got to be adaptive and responsive to the current climate, don't you? Yeah, and I think for our kids, like you know, I think about myself. You know, my parents. My parents grew up in the Second World War, so 
their their way the paradigm for them was about you know the the horrors of war and trauma and everything else and then they then became the baby boomers of the 50s and then i think about when i was growing up it was very much about consumerism you know getting stuff you go to school to earn more money so you can get more stuff um and it was about you know just consuming resources and and accumulating things whereas my children think more about sustainability which is you know recycle reuse but, but sustainability is about maintaining what you've got but i think for the next you know the kids at school today and in the future the next paradigm is about regeneration so it's not just about sustaining what we've got we've actually got to put value back into the environment and in the systems that we live and work in and so how do we get kids thinking regeneratively and how do we support them with that uh, uh, kids Oh, house. Sorry that you're in the background here. You, you follow I'm, it I'm up all, here, mate. Go for it. I'm <laughs> all over it. Um, is, oh, I love that. I, I hadn't really thought of that before, but you're so right. And damn those baby boomers and their consumerism. <laughs> um, is it uh, the, 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 the pace at which technology is growing and expanding is exponential? And I forget the name about it, but it's, it's doubling and doubling and doubling. Um, is there anything... Is that being noticed and factored into the the curriculum and trying to slow things down a little bit? Um, no, I think you know. I think we the kids coming through, they're the ones that have to create new technologies, um, and we need to keep. We need to be creative, and we need to be innovative, and we need to be looking for better solutions. And technology is often a part of those solutions. So they've got to. Um, you know, so for kids, it's not just about engaging with technology; it's looking at how they can once again, regenerate and, and add value back using technology. Um, something, I'm, I'm, I guess something I'm noticing with, with clients is, is everyone saying, oh, is there an app that can help me with meditation? Is there an app? And, and we're very becoming very reliant and dependent on all these things, which you know, I, was, I say to clients, well, meditation's been around for about 3,000 years and they did pretty yeah. well without an app for that long. Um, let's stop being... So the first thought is where is where's an app or where's where's some technology to to and I'm just you're breathing all right let's just focus on the breath and so I guess it's like getting back to uh, technology not being our first go to but sort of staying yeah. a bit grounded and connected within ourselves yeah well, absolutely and I think um like when we we talk about our approach to well being I mentioned before compassionate systems thinking is a way that we're so actually the way we think is the thing you know the ground soil you can talk about permaculture um and it all starts with our inner world so in order for us to to thrive in society we need to thrive inside ourselves to begin with so that means self-awareness but also having the, the tools and the the you know having awareness is one thing but also understanding and having the tools to shift our you know the way we feel where our emotions are at and um so Quite often, emotions drive the way that we think, and they drive the way that we feel, and the way that we interact. But if we if we can name where what our emotion might be at any particular stage, and and have the skills to shift that, um, that means that you're enabling people to have a better inner inner self understanding and self awareness. But also, they're more capable then of connecting with other people and connecting with communities, and all of these things contribute then to a more positive sense of well being. Technology doesn't need to be used for any of those things. So. Mm. Um, you know, but, but but having that self awareness and having the tools and the and the language to understand those things um, can make a huge difference in everyone's lives. And where does that come into the curriculum at uh, at Woodley? This some um, emotional awareness and and having those tools to be able to change the way we feel. Yeah, so it doesn't. That's the critical thing. And I think schools always think about well being is this, where's the program, where's the add on, where's the thing we go. It actually is embedded in everything you do. So it's it's not it, it's 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 everything in the curriculum and our thing. So it actually is the way we are and the way that we interact with each other. Um, yes, you have to teach students the tools of this, and to start with, all the adults that's around the kids need to understand this as well because they've got to be thriving for the kids to thrive. Um, so it's about working with the kids in everything we do, in the way that we think, in the way that we go through things, um, the way that we analyze things, um, and but building understanding of where kids are in the world and um and you know what's my role in the system i'm in and the system might be a classroom a school a family uh, a bigger community so what where where am i in that system how do i impact on that and where is everyone else and how do i interact with them um so 
So in terms of, I guess, to answer your question, you do need to be able to teach kids wellness techniques to help with that, like like um, meditation and, I guess, um, mindfulness is, is part of that. But also having the skills to unpack complexity is really important. And, you know, kids, not just kids, everyone gets anxious when they, when they if you think about the complexity of the world and the uncertainty of the world we live in at the moment, if you're not comfortable with those two things, your sense of well-being is going to really struggle due to a high heightened and consistent um, level of anxiety. So helping kids to and, and our community to be pretty comfortable with uncertainty and, and comfortable with complexity helps to reduce that, that level of anxiety, which you know is, is once again a really positive contributor to their well-being and their way forward. Yeah, well, I saw, well, I think, on your... It helps them to regulate their nervous system, I suppose, and gets them out of that fight, flight, so they're actually pro present and able to manage yeah. adversity or whatever it is. Absolutely. And, and you know, if, you, if you're sitting in a constant state of, you know, if your emotion's anger and you're sitting in that angry point all the time, it becomes a... You, you habituate that sense of that. You become the angry person. So it's if you can identify that I'm angry at the moment, this is why I feel angry. These are the things that have contributed to that. And here are some skills that I have to actually shift that emotion to the opposite, which is about, you know, feeling happy about the world um, or whatever it might be. So understanding your emotions and being really self-aware, but also having the skills to shift them when you need to, um, because the worst thing we can do is actually sit in a negative emotion for a long period of time. And that becomes us then, and, you, and people really struggle then to get out of that. Um, so those those skills are, are really critical for us and for everybody. And um, so helping kids to understand that, and it begins with the adults, you know, our staff. We're working with our staff at the moment to understand that, and then we'll spread that out to the you know the kids in the broader community. And so that's more like a educational uh, process for the staff. Is that what you're saying? Are they going through some some education in terms of that? Yeah, and 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 it's a it's a long term thing. It's not a um, once again, it's not a let's do a session on it. Everyone will understand it. It's actually embedding it into our what we do every day, into our personal lives, our professional lives, everything we do. Um, just being aware of these things and, and shifting the way people think is not an easy thing to do. But that's what we're actually talking about um, and helping them to think. Really. Well, that's what we're doing. Mindfit is, is basically helping people to helping adults to be more emotionally mature um, and self-aware, self-managed, and then they've got the social awareness and relationship management, you know, the four, four, four pillars of an EQ. Um, but we, we have a discovery session here, David, and, and we sort of unpack, you know, we're based on Buddhist philosophy and, and we sort of unpack thinking styles and, and the distortions and talk about suffering, you know, anger, but then uh, most of it's unnecessary suffering. And, and the, the question I get asked the most is, why aren't we learning this in schools? Why, did, why wasn't I taught this at school? Why, wasn't, why aren't my kids being exposed to this sort of information, these resources? Um, you know, soft skills why, why aren't this happening and it sounds like it's happening with woodley which is amazing but are you, is it happening in the rest of the, the system the school system um, we have to think differently about the way we do these things so the approach that most schools would have is that um there's a well-being crisis in the world at the moment so we'll get some well-being experts in who will talk to the kids one day and run this awesome program and then they leave and that's that so if, you, if we really want to make a difference, we've actually got to embed the, the, this way of thinking and these skills into everything that we actually do. Um, and that's, so that's the, I guess the, the, it's the way that we um, implement these ideas is, is, is probably the critical change. So it can't just be a, a, a one-off program or me as a principal standing up and talking about this. It's actually got to be something that everyone buys into and that takes a long time because, as I said, you're, you're asking people to change the way they think and the way that they interact with the world. Um, but if we, if we as the adults around the kids can't do it, then the kids are not going to be able to understand it as well. And it's um, and like my journey with this has taken years. It, it's not something you can sort of pick up in a day. Um, and, and I keep coming back to a lot of the same concepts with experts. And every time I do, I learn something new that I didn't pick up in the previous time. Um, so it's building capacity in myself, building capacity in the community, um, developing practice around that capacity, developing a sense of community around that practice, but continually feeding research back into what we do. 
Well, credit to a sense of authenticity. If you're living and breathing it, then mm. and, and the teachers are living and breathing it. And that was one of my questions as well: is yeah, you know, are the adults being educated, which they are? Because, the, but but are the parents being educated and included in this as well? Because the kids go home to that environment, yeah, uh, and. If it's very contrasting to what they're experiencing at school, there may be a lot of confusion for them. Yeah, absolutely. So that's you know that's what we've got to work on next is building a whole community of practice around this. Um, and that's um, and that, look, it does. You you have to invest a lot of time and a lot of effort into it to get it right. Um, and but we have to shift. We have to move away from this idea that we'll just get a quick fix in. We'll have a program. We'll have someone come and talk to the kids one day. And well being will be fine. Um, it just doesn't work. You know what. Um, <laughs> You're actually and triggering then, a memory for me here, David, um, which is so interesting. I remember back when I was doing year 12, so 2001, um, and my school, it, it did not have a culture of what you're talking about. It's saying like you're saying that you teach all these different things and experiences with, with the students, but the underlying theme is having this, you know, emotional wellness and community and relationship, which which is fantastic. And, you know, I definitely didn't have that at my school. And speaking of the quick fix, I remember towards the end of year 12, they brought this crew in for a day. It was a day program where they would try and help teach us about emotions and and just classic trying the, the the basically the staff going we're fucking up here can someone come in and help us out and I'll never forget this day it was this wonderful program and they actually helped the the walls of a lot of the students come down and there was students were crying in front of each other apologizing to kids that we bullied all that kind of stuff but then the next day everyone forgot about it <laughs> and yeah. then like it took it took well, a few so, days so after and down, everything isn't... went back to normal and like yeah. it's it just right that the quick fix like that just does not work if the underlying culture like literally the culture that the students yeah. are in like in that pe petri dish it will determine the the health of that that cell or that human being yeah and that's and that's that permaculture reference as well you know you gotta get the soil mm -hmm. right um and the soil is all of us and um and and, and that takes a long time and you gotta invest in that because if you don't get that bit right, it becomes a, you know, come and go activity that has no real, might have impact for a short term, but it doesn't change the culture of the school. Uh, I was just recently um, employed to, to go up north and work with a, a shire up there to, you know, they just said, we, we have all this funding, how to, you know, what can we do? And I said, well, I don't just want to come up there for a day and do a presentation and leave. I'd love to, you know. Get boots on the ground and get my hands dirty and, and stay for a week and, and really get to know the community and everything. Uh, and it was great. And it, was, it was all going beautifully, but I started to see the, the root cause of, of the, the culture. And unfortunately, it was up the top. And, and I, I couldn't affect change because there was no willingness for change to happen where it needed to happen. And yeah. so it, I, I couldn't. I couldn't help get the soil right, um, yeah. and so I just have to you know, do my best and walk away from that. But it's it's so so pleasing to to hear that you've you've got this holistic approach and and this um, let let's 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 do this for for years to come, not just throw something throw a band aid at the symptom. Yeah, and look, I've, I've been in education for a long time, and. Um, how long, David? You know, <laughs> over 30 years. And, okay. and you know, I, I remember when I first started teaching, wellbeing was never spoken about. These things were, you know, unheard of. So in the last 30 years, we've added all of these things to schools, but the wellbeing issue is still exponentially increasing. So they're not working. Um, oh, so, right. well, we, Ryan and I speak about that. The, the, the mental yeah. health industry, you know, billions are spent on the symptom, but, yeah. You know, what Ryan and I are doing is really trying to work on the root cause of things and create change yeah. here. But it, it's so it just popped up in my head. Like, it wasn't too long ago that teachers were actually smacking kids <laughs> and, and uh, with a cane, and, and now, we're, now we're talking about my wellness. parents. It's... My parents were in that area, they got hit with a cane, <laughs> and they, yeah, they would hit you. I'm, I'm a lefty, so if I was born back then, they'd hit me on the hand because you weren't meant to write left handed. Like, that's so archaic <laughs> when you think about it now. <laughs> Yeah. It was a wooden spoon with my parents. <laughs> yeah, same, same. But remember the, the day the you, know, you think about that community you walked into, um, you can sense the social feel the minute you walk in there. And, um, you know, and any school, if you walk into a school, you'll, you'll feel the social feel of the school, the way people interact with each other. Sometimes you don't, it's not even visible, you just feel it. But schools have to be this place where you have generative social feel. So how do you create that? And, and what, 
the adults in the room need to understand is that they have the biggest influence on the generative social appeal they create in their classroom, in meetings, whatever it might be. So when you went to the council, that, that community up north, you would have felt that straight away. So understanding, getting to the root cause of why that's there is so, it's a, it's a massive thing and it's and that's the critical thing we should be looking at. Well, I've, I've done it at a few, uh, in a few workplaces. I, I go around, you know, it's under the banner of psychological safety in the workplace um uh, but but i'm noticing a theme uh, in doing it is, is that the 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 people ask me to come in and work on the culture are the ones that need the most work but they're just looking at everyone else going they're not doing fix what we want them to yeah f- fix all them make them more like us and i'm mm. like oh, no i've got to work with you and that, that we're not the problem and i'm like <laughs> oh well, here's, here's your money back sorry i can't yeah. help yeah exactly and it's um and that's so right and it, it is and what what you know if, if there's a low staff morale or there's whatever it might be what why is that the case and you know you've got to dig pretty deep to find out that there's there's probably trust issues there's probably um, conflict in the workplace. There's probably people who don't know where their place is in that system and what they're supposed to be doing. So you've got uncertainty for them. And all of those things contribute then to the root cause of what's actually going on. Usually it's just a, there's tyranny at the top or, or, or toxicity at the top and it's yeah. just being projected like a waterfall yeah. down to everyone below. So yeah. Uh, Stats, Ryan. Oh, I sent you some stats this morning. Do you want to touch on them at all? Or? Um, yeah, I'll pull them up. While I'm pulling them up, just something I'm also interested in, David, is uh, your take on drug education in schools. Yeah. Uh, so drug education, it's, it, it's a ma- once again a massive issue in all schools at the moment. As vaping in particular, if you put it in the same category, um, it's... Uh, I guess, you know, once again, I think back to when I was at school, people drank and smoked cigarettes and that was it. But these days they have access to so, so many different things, but they don't. I think drug education starts with understanding what are the drugs that are there and actually having an open conversation about what's being taken at the moment, what's out there, and understanding what what actually goes into that drug, the impact it can have on you, the long-term impact, um, where is it coming from, the quality control, the, the you know some statistics around um, you know the, the the impact or the damage that's being done by various drugs. So, um, and I once again I hate to say we bring a program in, but we actually do use Paul Dillon to help us with that at our school, um, and he's he's amazing. If you ever have anything to do with him, but just talking to our what kids about name? vaping, Paul Dillon. Yep. Um, but yep, I guess I, he's allowed to. Ex- are you allowed to expose kids? Sorry, I'm just trying to understand. If there's a group of 15-year-olds there, are you allowed to pull out a slideshow and say, this is Columbia, this is where cocaine is made, this is the process of cocaine being made? Yeah. You know, are you allowed to, to sort of put a spotlight or highlight the drugs that are there because they know what's there? Um, yeah. But are you, are you allowed to sort of go down that road with them? Oh, absolutely. And if you're a 15-year-old kid, what do you want to hear from the school? Um, just being told all the time, don't take drugs? Or do you want to actually be exposed to well, what are you taking? Do you know where it comes from? And do you know what, what it can actually do to you? Um, so that oh, yeah, it's, stop, be- it's stopping treating kids like idiots, you know, because that's yeah. one big gripe that I have is these scare tactic campaigns that, that um, mm. schools bring in. And, you know, there's been a lot of studies done in America that show they actually have the reverse effect of what they were yeah. initially intended. And, you know, we tell yeah. people, you know, not even once. I hate that slogan. You know, don't even take it once and or you're going to become hooked, which is just not true um, for the vast mm. majority of people. And as soon as people then grow up and they are going to do drugs, you know, 99.9% of kids are going to do drugs in some form or another. And then when they realize that, hey, I took it once and I'm not hooked, then they just throw out all of the, what they learned at this drug education yeah. class in school. And they're like, oh, they just lied to me. When there might be yeah. some obviously very good aspects to drug education, but I just think we do treat kids like um, like idiots when it comes to And the parents yeah. as well, the parents' issue is the parents want to outsource it just to the school and go, you yeah. sort that out because we don't want to have that conversation with them because we're uncomfortable having it. If you yeah. if you tell a fifteen year old to not do something, immediately in their head they're going to go. I'm going to go and do that. Must be good. Must be like good it. if they're telling yeah. me not to do it. <laughs> yeah. So you know, and, and I think we've also got to respect the kids. Probably know more about drugs than I do. Yeah. Um, so it's you know because it, it's but but so it's understanding, and you can't 
kids, um, you know, they smell through BS in a second. So mm. you've got to be you've got to be open with them. You've got to be honest with them, but you've actually got to be truthful and say this is actually, and you've got to back it up. Um, Ryan could come and share share his yeah. story about his time in jail from drugs and really sort of <laughs> expose him to to life as life as a hard yeah, drug. Forty eight of the hardest hours anyone's ever done in prison, to be honest. <laughs> Um, but no, I am. Um, I'm just. I, I look at. Go, Nick. <coughs> Ryan and I both look at, at, at drugs as a, as medication um, sometimes as well. So the kids that are drawn to the drugs and alcohol and everything, uh, a lot of the time will be low self esteem, low self worth. Um, there'll yeah. be unhealed trauma going on. So is, is that also sort of acknowledged or factored into anything yeah so this is getting back to the root cause as well and you were talking about that at the start so um if, if our what you know if our approach to well-being is working and kids have that great sense of self-awareness they should be able to like, hopefully identify within themselves where they're going why am i feeling this way and is that really going to solve my problems um it might give me a quick bit of relief from the you know the the pain i'm feeling at the moment but that but understanding that that relief's going to go, and when it goes, the pain I'm feeling is going to be back, but twice as bad. Um, so it's really going on that. You know, you're talking about individuals now in terms of where individuals are at and how you know individual kids, adults do it the same in the same way. But if, depending on what's happening in their life at the moment, how they feel about themselves, they will drift towards drugs and alcohol as a solution. Um, and that's and that's a real challenge. So if you want to if you want to prevent that happening, you're better getting to the source before and figuring out what's going on in people's lives before that actually happens. Which is why yeah. you know emotional intelligence and community is so important because when yeah. those are absent, um, there's no other way that people will feel safe to express their pain or no tools to actually deal with it. And so then drugs or alcohol become the only option they know, even if it does cause cause more pain down the road. They'll keep going back to it because a little bit of relief is better than no relief. So, you know, yeah. the, the philosophies that you're embedding there at Woodley, I think, are going to have more impact than any, you know, specific drug education kind of program that, that is brought in. And I, and I think for people, not just kids, if, you, if you're surrounded by people who know you and care for you and are aware of where you're at, they'll pick up when things are not going well. And that's when I think people end up in trouble when, they're drifting down a rabbit hole and, and things aren't going well for them and no one's picking up on it. No one knows where they're at. No one knows why they're, they're moving, um, I guess, towards a very negative space and is there to help them. So having those connections with each other, with the community is so important because then you hope that someone will pick up and go, you know what, something's not right for that person today. Um, and then we can get to the, well, what is going on for them before it becomes a bigger issue down the track. The community well, gets around comes- them. It's beautiful. Yeah, but you, you, you can't help others unless you're okay either. So you know, that's where that look after yourself first and foremost, get yourself in a good space and, and do the work in here. And then you're in a position to, to notice that your mate's mm-hmm. sort of sliding or had a few days off school or mm-hmm. you, you, because you're not in survival mode within yourself. Um, Ryan, you're talking about the, the philosophies, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious, David, if you if you are introducing philosophies, um, and I ask because I, I, I my schooling, I was I bounced around and, and very low self esteem, low self worth, um, which led to a big ripple effect for me. And and I remember coming across um, those that matter don't mind and those that mind don't matter. Or Peter says about Paul, says more about Peter than says about Paul and, and all these things. And, and I found them retrospectively it would have been really helpful at an early age to, to come into contact with. It's not someone, uh, you know, it's not the school telling me. It's it's, it's more just wisdom. Mm-hmm. Um, is that something that kids are, are coming to contact with? Yeah, I think, you know, going right back to the start when I was talking about the school, you know, we value the experiences that kids have because that's where they're going to come across people that they may not come across in their normal day daily life and um, and, can, and also have experiences that they may not have on a, you know, so if you're give an example, if I'm taking a group of kids on a hike somewhere that I don't know and have nothing to do with before, by, the, by day five, we're going to know each other pretty well and we've made a good connection and I'm going to have a pretty good understanding of where they're at and also each other. And then there's an opportunity for support and in the worst case scenario, intervention. But it's, um, you know, so it is, and it's not just 
hiking, it's sport, it's every all of these things that kids do are so important. Um, not because that's where they develop sort of a sense of self and, and their, their own capabilities, but also where connection happens. Um, and it's also where people, you know, understand who they are, understand what they're good at, and can develop help them develop that sense of self esteem and identity. I'd love to get into schools and and help them to not be fully connected to their identity. Though I'd love to do some ego ego work with kids at an early age because yeah. you know we're not our thoughts we're not our feelings we're just conscious awareness and and people heavily identify as this and then when change happens or whatever um mm. they lose their identity then they go on the decline so yeah for me it's an interesting balancing act between all right yes i i, I am this but also i am not this and, mm. and i think yeah, i wonder how effective that would be like i don't know but like it's like whilst the ego structure is still forming, then training them to mm. disidentify from that. I just wonder until it's fully kind of formed where that work would come in. It would be interesting to me, that's all. Well, well, Buddhist, Buddhist monks started from a very early age um, and, and they're walking around with this sense of no self concept from an early age. They're, they're not able to, to embody it because you want them to be kids. You want them to be playful and experience and... and you know, create the identity, but but not not allowing. You know, the ego is going to be formed, but you don't want the ego in the driver's seat to dominate. The, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, I think if you think about young people, they they develop their sense of self when they're in a safe space where they can express who they are and who they want to be, and sometimes they express themselves in a way they don't want to be, and that changes, and it gives them insight into who they really are. Um, but you've got to be able to provide that safe space for them to be who they, you know, because you think about an adolescent child, every day they look in the mirror, someone different's looking back at them. So that change happens really rapidly for them. And that creates a real sense of, well, who am I? And I'm not really happy with who I am. And I want to be someone else. or I want to be someone different. So how do you provide a safe space where they can actually be themselves and feel comfortable with that and feel okay with that? Um, and that's, you know, and that's a challenge when you're in a, Group of teenagers. It's not always easy to do. I just had my. I just got out of my comfort zone. Um, I predominantly work with adults, but but oh, I do work with adults. But I, I chose to take on a fifteen-year-old client recently, and I've just finished a twelve-week program with her. And, and I it really challenged me. I really had to modify and adapt and adjust the way that I worked. Um, and but listening to her, you know there was such this beautiful underlying emotional intelligence that, that mm. hadn't been tapped into. And she started turning up and I'd say, how are you? And she said, oh, I'm a bit sad. I'm like, oh, wonderful. What, what can you share with me? Why? And she said, oh, I have, I have to tell a friend that, that I need some space from them. You know, I'm just right. like, what? You've got that, that ability. Boundary yeah, setting. Yeah, but, wow. Yeah, yeah. And... and 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 without toxicity, you know, without any judgment, without any, um, and she really, really took and ran with it. And I, I was just, I was really caught off guard. We, we have a graduation board, um, and and she got to write on it at the end of her program. I just took a photo of it, and she essentially saying, "Nick has provided me to be a better person. Um, uh, has taught me more than life itself." And it's just uh, you don't realise the impact you're having on, on these very susceptible, vulnerable kids and, and providing yeah. that safe space where they can open up without any judgement is, is so yeah. critical and vital. And, and you think about schools traditionally, they're places where adults judge young people, you know, the way they look and the way they do things and how well they're working, are you working hard enough, are you not working at all? you know, um, cut your hair, get, you know, do your tie up, pull your socks up. Um, that's the judge. That's what schools have been about. You're giving me flashbacks to high school now, David. Sorry. I'll go back <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm trying to fit back into that box. Yeah. Yeah. And exactly. Like you talk about, like it's a funnel, you know, you, you, all of these kids come in that are hugely different and schools have traditionally wanted to make them all the same, look the same, behave the same, sound the same, do, do the same things academically. So, you know, flipping the funnel is really critical in schools at the moment. So allowing, and kids are so much smarter than I was as a, as a, as a young person. Um, and, you, you know, your experience, you're just talking about it, really, our, all of our young people are really good at that because they're, um, 
you know, they're, they're, they know what they want in life. They're, um, they're so much more informed and, they, uh, and, they, and they're ready to express themselves so much more readily than, you know, I was. Um, you know, someone asked me recently what, what it was, you know, what was my overriding feeling when I was at school as a student? And I think my overriding desire was to not be noticed <laughs> in any way, shape or form. Um, and yep. people don't want to be noticed because they're scared of being judged. Um, so how do you allow kids to be themselves and encourage them to be themselves as well? And, support and, and, them, support support them in that. And, yeah. and I guess the way that's where diversity comes in. You know, the ego by its nature doesn't like difference, so we, that's where we get into that judging critical minds. Yeah. But if, if we're teaching kids that difference is actually diversity is really great, you go back to permaculture, principle there you know yeah. we we need the quiet types we need the the class clowns we need the the brainiacs we need the, the sporty people we need we need everyone's equally as important yeah and uh and and i don't think schools have ever done that very well and uh not what i want to say yeah. I, I, I was a class clown and i used to get sent out every lesson yeah. i was the opposite of you david i was like oh, look at me because i was yeah. trying to that was all that was all insecurity though so it was mm. insecurity maybe popping up in in coming out in different ways it's the same Someone underlying driver isn't it yeah different behavior yeah. on top so yeah. if you think about that from a well-being point of view if you're living every day of your life just about for six years feeling like that those feelings habituate into the person that you become and it's any wonder we have anxiety problems and well-being problems and mental health issues um, because we're doing everything we can to enhance those problems and we're not actually addressing the real problem which is about how, helping kids to learn who they are and being comfortable with that we have a motto here that says adulthood is just undoing everything that happens in childhood yeah, correct, yeah. And, and and a lot of that comes down to skills. So I, I don't know about you, Hass, but probably ninety percent of my clients are are deeply affected by their school experience. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, to what percentage before that? But yeah, definitely during that, I would say over ninety percent that I've seen. And yeah, that's why me and Nick were so excited to have you on today, David, because like we we work with the adults we've got all these insecurities and everything from when we were younger and it's like you know the desmond tutu quote is instead of pulling people out of the river let's find out why they're falling in and that starts yeah. in this in this early childhood with their development and their social structures and i think mm -hmm. you spoke earlier about you know coming in and trying to do the quick fix and i think a lot of schools and our government have this idea like yeah there's a mental health issue we'll throw as much money as possible at it when actually mm -hmm. systemic change is what's required and systemic change mm -hmm. takes a lot longer than the supposed quick fix, but the ripple effects are so much greater for generations to come. And I just hope that more schools mm -hmm. uh, and people listening who have kids can start to adopt this um, this orientation, I guess, because um, mm -hmm. it's going to have great impact moving forward in the decades to come. I think so. And, and, and you talk about systems change. I mean, how can a government implement systems change when they've got three years to do it? Exactly. Um, and, and, and everything they do is, is, is directed by popularity and will I get voted in again so mm. you know so we the media and the government don't think systemically and and they're the ones that are influencing the way young people think and if they're not thinking and once again you know the the, the answer to everything is throw more money at it but actually what's the problem and we don't ever address the problem and um, well, that's the well, mental health industry is the yeah. same David it's, yeah. it's the I, I, I'm championing for a world in which there, there there needs to be no therapist. I'd love to be out of a job one day. You Man, know, Nick, we could be unreal. pro golfers then. We'd be out of work. It'd be fantastic. <laughs> well, well, not pro. Maybe maybe we could be caddies or okay. putt putt tour or something. I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's it's, it's uh, so. I, I, we spoke to Luby once again um, about permaculture and. And I love what David Holmstrom was doing. And instead of trying to looking at the system going, it's a terrible farming system. It's, a, it's a, uh, no change has changed yet. He just started creating, he, he went, what can I do? And he started creating something. He channeled his time and his energy and his power and, and everything into, into building another system that will hopefully one day with time be much more attractive than the old antiquated one. Yeah. And, and I, I feel that's sort of the path that you're off, uh, would layer on. Yeah, you, you're exactly right. It is. It, it's um, you know, if you want to, if you want to make change, you've got to create change, and 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 that's got to happen over a period of time. And Woodley's always been about that. And I think um, 
the thing that like I love about this school the most is that when Michael Norman started, that was the philosophy. All that's happened in the last 50 odd years that we've been here is that the actual science has caught up with the philosophy of what he was trying mm-hmm. to do. And we, we understand it better now and we've got research to back it up. Um, whereas, you know, he, when he started the school, he, he came, he said the, the days of the school were respect for self, respect for others and respect for an environment. And it, everything you read about well-being at the moment is about developing your inner world, respect for self, developing an understanding of where you fit in the social world, respect for others, and understanding your environment or, you know, understanding the natural and the man-made world and the systems that underpin that. So his values, you know, the alignment between his values and where compassionate systems thinking is going are, are amazing. And, I, you know, I often wonder, did he know about this 50 years ago or was he just a genius or was it just good luck? It was, pro- it was yeah. probably a reincarnate of a, of a, yeah. of a Buddha or a, a master, some master. Buddhist, a monk. <laughs> yeah. have, you come, have you, I don't know if you've come across any of Ram Dass's work, but he, he, one of his... Um, Quips is we're all just w- walking each other home, and and that's something that you know, we're we're trying to get away from psychology in here as much as we can. The latest this, the latest that. We we use all this old stuff, um, and when you introduce that so simply, we're all just walking each other home. People are like, oh, and and, and along along the way, if if we're if we've got a sore foot and we're, oh, bloody, oh, this and that, if we're angry and, and whatever, we're in no position to walk someone else home or if someone falls over, in no position to, hey, you okay, mm-hmm. and employ that compassion. So everything we teach here is yeah, inwardly focused and it's, it's be love love in here and be compassionate towards the self and take care of yourself mentally, emotionally, physically here mm-hmm. first so, so we can walk other people home who may not be in a position to do a good job of walking themselves home. Yeah, correct. And that's where, you know, the adults in our community have to be in that situation where they can live what we have you know, live the philosophy of the school so that they can then influence the students and help them. But if do, you, the parents, you how, 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 do the parents buy into or how, how do you engage the parents? And, uh, and, and Yeah, it's a bit harder. Um, you know, we're looking at workshops and I guess, you know, how you do it with teachers is through professional learning. So let's let's offer professional learning for, for parents. Um, so we engage them regularly with um, you know, different forums, different seminars, different workshops. So trying to get them involved as well, because um, it is it's it's challenging if you don't work in this space and you the school's telling you all of these things. You, you're trying to unpack it for yourself and think, well, what does that mean for me? So we have to help them to understand that as we do it with the teachers and the other staff here. And I think, you know, teachers are more stressed at the moment than I've ever seen them in my career. So we have to work with them first and get it right, help them to help themselves. And then then we broaden that out to the broader community and the kids. Um, why, why is that, do you think, David? Why are they seemingly more stressed than you've ever seen in your career? Um, I think it's a, it's a number of things and it's pretty complex and there's no you know, easy, easy sort of understanding of that. But there's, uh, you know, coming out of COVID was a, a really, I guess, a, a time of challenge for a lot of teachers. Um, coming back to school was a time of challenge for a lot of teachers. Um, at the, and, you know, for this year in particular, dealing with, um, you know, a school that doesn't get into flow is really difficult and it doesn't get into flow because we've been interrupted continuously for so long. Um, you're also teaching a group of kids that in some respects have experienced trauma for many of them, um, you've got every, every day when you turn up, you, you know, you're going you're gonna to have absences, you're going to have kids away, you're going to have other staff members away, and everyone's constantly working to fill the gaps and chasing people up and the kids that weren't here, how do I help them? And uh, and so there's this, it sort of creates this constant sense of, um, of uh, I guess, anxiety. So, uh, and then it doesn't take much then to upset you when you're in that state. So how do you, so once again, if we can build that, capacity within the teaching staff, within all of our staff to understand themselves and how they can manage some of these complex issues, it's going to enable them to be in a better state than to present themselves and create generative social spaces for the kids that are teaching them. Okay, great. Uh, I'm, I'm already constructing a healthy parenting program in my head at the yeah. moment. It's, it's, uh, yeah, I'd love, to, I'd love to work with parents to because uh, I already do. I had a client in yesterday saying, "This is this is what my child's doing. What do I yeah. do in this situation?" And I said, "Just 
just observe them for a minute and meet them on their level and be employ compassion and, and just yes. just be curious and um but in hearing the parents you know, are struggling as well because the kids are struggling after COVID especially and mm. there's the, the, the such a disconnect, a physical disconnect. We can't play, we can't wrestle, we can't mm. do all these things. Uh, are, are you noticing, did you notice you know, in the coming back and then, and then having to get out, the, 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 there was no consistency really. Were, were the kids yeah, really weird. affected by that? It was huge because, I mean, you've got year nines at the start of this year. You've got a group of year nines at school who have never been at school for more than about four weeks at a time. Uh, they haven't experienced, they haven't had any of the experiences that we've, um, you know, we what the school is built around these experiences and they've had none of them. So the things that we would normally use to help them, I guess, induct them into the way we do things, they haven't had those. So they're coming back into school not knowing how the school works and not knowing how to interact with each other. And we've also got... Like I've got kids in grade one and grade two, their first two years of school were at home. Um, mm. So they, you know, so you're trying with six and seven year olds, you're trying to introduce them to school in a consistent way you, for the first you, time. Do you manage them any differently to to the other kids, like those year nine groups that's coming through? Um, yeah, it's just trying to be. I think it's really looking for opportunities to get them out and out and about and doing things and and actually having outside of the classroom experiences. With the, the younger kids, it's also the parents because we've got a group of parents who have had no connection to the school for two or three years, even though they've been at the school. So they, they, they're not. So all of the things that we would use to normally help people understand who we are as a school haven't happened. And so we've got people, parents and students who aren't quite getting who we are as a school just yet. Um, and it's going, to take, it's going to take years to recover from this situation. You know, it's almost a whole generation of kids will need to go through school before we get back to some form of normality. Yeah. I want to get to these stats, Nico. All right. Yeah, cool. Okay. Because we are we're coming up on an hour and I would love to get uh your thoughts on this, David. So um, Well, I, yeah. I just I just came across this this morning, David, and, and shared it with Ryan because I thought it'd be yeah, good to to learn if, if you're seeing this these stats in within the school. Yeah, so they're basically, and we read about it a lot, that, that young kids are really being affected by uh, mental illness, by self-harm, by suicide, and those numbers are being reflected by the stats at the minute, um, saying that, you know, between the ages of 15 to 24, suicide's a leading cause of death here in Australia. Um, it's also got numbers of, and this is from 2020, I can only imagine these numbers might be a little bit higher now. Um, also, young people have the right, highest rates of hospitalization for intentional self-harm. Um, so especially in kids uh, 14 and under, which is really, really sad. And um, also the rates of, um, especially in girls and young females uh, have been rising. And that's probably the last decade that's been rising really, really drastically. So uh, maybe get your thoughts on that, but also with your, you know, three plus decades of experience and interacting with students, you know, mm -hmm. have you seen this trend or how have you, in your perception, seen the mental health of kids being in that time? Um, I think this has been a slow burn for a long time, but I think the pandemic's accelerated it really quickly and it's brought it, it's been happening for a long, long period of time. Um, and, you know, it's a, once again, it's a really complex issue and, and what's at the cause of it. There's so many things that create this or, or, or a part of this. You know, you can, the, the sense of optimism kids have about the world they live in is really low. Um, you know, they, they're looking at a world that they think is going to self implode in the next 10 years. Um, they feel like there's no solution to climate change. They feel like the, there's war going on. We're on, you know, and then as these kids, as these thoughts are perpetuating, you then throw them into a pandemic. So they, they have no ability to connect with others and form a sense of belonging to community, which are the critical pillars of well-being. Um, so I think this has been around, this has been escalating for a long time, but the last three years it's just accelerated exponentially. And I think you also have to throw on top of that um, the impact of, of technology, um, social media, um, mobile phones. These things actually do have a negative impact on the way everyone thinks because you, you're you constantly being bombarded with messaging, um, whether it's from other kids, whether it's from your news feed, whether it's from social media. And probably I would suspect that most of, that, most of those messages you're getting are negative. So in terms of your emotional state, you know, if, you, if you've got this constant bombardment of negative messages or criticism or um, judge judgment happening um, on top of a sense of pessimism about the world we live in, 
um, on top of a sense of lack of connection because you haven't been at school for two years, it's it's not surprising. And you know, and and there's other, you know, it's much much more complex than that as well. But there's so many things going on for these kids, um, and so many things happening in the world that create anxiety for them. And they're not equipped with the skills to sort of understand who they are and how they feel and how they can shift that. And uh, and that's you know, and that's where we've got to start is thinking about well, if they can understand better who they are and understand better why what how they're feeling and why they feel that way before it perpetuates into something that becomes really habitual for them. Um, it will, you know, simple things will escalate into depression, depression will escalate escalate into, into action really, really quickly. Mm. And they're so defenceless. I, I heard um, recently the, the amount of information hitting a child's brain is the equivalent to them being in a car crash. Like this yeah. is their brains are, are in such a sensitive developmental stage and it's just getting bombarded with stimulus, stimulus, stimulus. And then they get home and the stimulus, 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 and then they're not sleeping. And then it's just they go around in circles. I, I don't know how. We need to do a better job of, of protecting them. The parents, I think do. the, I think we the parents need to, are the one modelling it. You know, yeah, we shouldn't. Yeah, I, I honestly think kids shouldn't get mobile phones until much older. Um, mm. I think that you know, harking back to when I was a kid back in the dark ages, but it was you know, you have a, you know, you'd have a fight with your mate on a Friday night, and you know, a few words would be said, and you'd go home on Saturday and Sunday. By Monday, everyone's forgotten about it. Um, mm. These days, the kids have a fight on an argument on Friday. It escalates on Friday night on social media. More people get involved on Saturday. It escalates again on Saturday night because someone, they're all out at something, continues all day Sunday. By the time they get back on Monday morning, the whole thing is an absolute disaster and it's out of control and there's more and more people involved. And kids kids can't retrieve those situations and it happens for them every weekend. Um, they're either at the source of the problem or they're observing the problem with their friends or someone else or they're buying into it and actually contributing to the problem um and it's just such a different world to you know the the i guess the non-technology world i grew up in where that that sort of stuff you actually had space to get over things and a bit of distance to move forward without having to keep keep being reminded of, uh, of what's going on and kids are addicted to their phones and it's it's, it's a huge problem so it sounds and like we're going to be pro, pro golfers anytime soon Huss. Sounds like our our, job, our jobs are My safe. Dreams have been shattered right now. <laughs> I, know, I know. I can't believe Woodney's not going to be able to produce a perfect, well balanced, emotionally healthy, hundred percent great. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's disappointing, David. Mm. I'm really <laughs> sad to hear. <laughs> I just can't. I, I mean, we're, we're going to wrap up, but I can't thank you enough for the work that you are doing and the impact that you are having. And I just wish that someone in a position of authority or power would look at Woodland and go, oh, let's just sprinkle that everywhere and and, yeah. and change the system. But as you said, it's, um, we're up against it, so we can do what we can do, control the controllables and, and, and yeah, deal with what's in front of us. And you're doing an amazing job, so thank you. And uh, we appreciate you coming on today. It's a pleasure. Thank you both. Thanks so much, David. Thank you, Nico, as always. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We will see you all next week.